But now, on to tonight's event. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Tony Parker, our chair this evening, uh, who is the fellow, who's fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and of the Science and Technologies Funding Council. For 25 years, Tony has been at the forefront of developing the use of lasers for a di diverse range of applications in the fields of physical sciences, materials, and biomedical sciences. He's an expert in Raman spectroscopy and has worked with Andy and his team uh, identifying some of the pigments used in medieval manuscripts. So, Tony, over to you. Thank you, Jerry, and uh, welcome everybody as well. Um, Professor Andy Beebe, <laughs> yes, what we'll start with. Um, well, he began his working career in 1977 um, at Boots, Nottingham, um, where he was born. Um, he was a bottle washer and he started this job two months before his 16th birthday. Um, I don't know, thinking about things, washing up bottles, I suppose he decided this wasn't enough. And he went on to University of East Anglia, where he began his degree, his degree in chemistry. After that, he went back into industries, helping set up Park Davis in Cambridge. Still persisting his thirst for knowledge, he went on to do a PhD in 1984, uh, back to the University of East Anglia, working with John Soddo. There he began a his excellent career in photochemistry, where he looked at uh, the photochemistry of aldehydes, ketones, and simple sugars in solution. After this, 1988, he went on to work with David Phillips, who's here tonight. Uh, David, and that's where we met, actually. Um, and David has been a, a great stillwart throughout our, our careers as well. David is one of these supervisors who doesn't only teach you what you need to know, he teaches you what you don't do. And I think that was the important thing that uh, he bestowed upon us. Um, in 1992, he went up to Durham, where he became a, a lecturer, and he's worked through the ranks, where he is now uh, an active research professor. Again, continuing his expertise in photochemistry, in particular luminescent materials. Um, it, he has uh, run 12 PhD students, and there's still coming more through. From the Royal Society of Chemistry perspective, he won an industrial prize in photochemistry in 2003. He became a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in 2005. Um, one of his students said of him, and I'm going to quote, he is not just a spectroscopist, he is a problem solver. His inventiveness and multidiscipline skills sets him apart. So apart from um, Raman spectroscopy that we're going to hear about tonight, uh, what really Andy's done is to develop a lot of gadgetry that we use. And those of you who may have bought a camera around about 25 years ago and are looking for around for one today, you will see that this technology has really advanced leaps and bounds. Um, the first digital camera weighed something like four kilograms. It had about 16 nickel cadmium batteries. Uh, you stored the image onto a cassette that took about three minutes, and to read it back took about the same time. And it's really what Andy's done for this kind of technology, in particular developing a lot of uh, portable instrumentation, if you like. Andy's gone from lasers in the laboratory, spectroscopy in a suitcase, where he did a lot of... Uh, work with public engagement, and now we've got Raman in a rucksack. And that's really where I think he's, he's coming from tonight. Um, some of his notable scientific achievements are developing near-infrared sensors. Um, this is beyond the silicon band gap where your average camera works, in particular these germanium systems, and making them really user-friendly and noise-free systems. Uh, particular expertise is in studying the photophysical properties of lanthanides. And just to give you some idea of his impact in the field, he published in 1999 an article in Perkin Transactions. And it's been, well, when I looked yesterday, it had been cited 779 times. When I looked today, it had gone up another two. So that just goes to show. But if you take out Christmas and Easter, that is an average citation of one a week, which is very impressive and well done, Andy. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's get on with going from lasers in the laboratory, <laughs> spectroscopy in a suitcase to ramen in a rucksack. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Andy Beebe. Well, thank you very much for those kind words, Tony, and, and thank you very much and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. 
Um, I'd like to tell you about a project which I got involved with about two and a half years ago, sort of by accident, but it's a, a fantastic serendipitous accident, looking at medieval manuscripts. My normal bread and butter, if you like, is luminescence spectroscopy and optical spectroscopy generally. So I'm interested in things that glow. I found this fascinating as a, an undergraduate student, and so it became the topic of my PhD. It became the topic of my postdoc and on my subsequent academic research. And the sort of strange things we look at. Well, I don't know if any of you have got budgerigars at home, but they fluoresce. Here's a budgerigar under normal illumination. Here's a budgerigar under UV light. So take a UV torch and have a look at your budgie. Anti-counterfeiting technology relies heavily upon luminescence. In fact, uh, if you take a, a, a £10 note, for example, here, you have a Harlequin 10 that lights up in the ultraviolet. It's there because it's an anti-counterfeiting technology. It's there for shopkeepers and banks to be able to see. What you don't perhaps realise is the red glow there is europium. The euro has arrived. But they put europium in for a very good photophysical reason. And we can have a chat about it. I'm happy to talk to people about that later on. Um, gemstones fluoresce. Uh, in fact, gemstones, this gemstone is a uh, Weirdale Fleur Spa. And now I think, having lived in the Northeast for well, 22 years, I think I'm sort of almost a naturalised um, local. And Weirdale is actually the home of fluorescence. George Stokes in 1852 published a paper on luminescence, on fluorescence, and he named fluorescence after our stone Fleur Spa, Weirdale Fleur Spa. That's this stone here. This is a lump of ruby, synthetic ruby, I hasten to add. Not real, well, not natural ruby. Uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the gin and tonic. Um, you've, I'm sure you've seen uh, tonic water fluoresce in, under ultraviolet light. And these little guys, these scorpions, this is actually a tame scorpion. It's got big claws. If you ever meet a scorpion, look at the size of its claws. Uh, if you're a scorpion, you have big claws, you don't need a big sting. And uh, that's not my hand, I hasten to add. So these things glow under ultraviolet illumination or visible illumination. And we try and understand why those things happen. And it's shining light onto molecules and looking at how the light comes back off them. As Tony alluded, I'm also interested in making machines that do this. I'm interested in the technology that enables us to do this kind of measurements, but in, under rather unusual circumstances. And so building new instruments and imaging techniques are where it's at now in science. So that's what, we, that's what my research group um, do. So I'd like to introduce how I got involved in this project. Now, I'm, I'm, sort of slightly embarrassed and, and pleased to say that, um, that the gentlemen involved, the couple involved, are, are sitting here in the audience. I was in the tea room at Durham, and I was uh, asked by my head of department, could I have a chat to someone, one of our alumni? I said, yeah, I I'm happy to have a chat. You know, I always have a chat with uh, ex-Durham chemists, or any chemist for that matter. And um, Rob Shepherd um, and his wife Felicity um, came to Durham. They said, well, the, the Lindisfarne Gospels are coming to Durham. The, the exhibition is opening in 2013. Wouldn't it be great if, um, if you could use spectroscopy to look at what these books are made of? Could you use Raman or, or fluorescent spectroscopy to do that? And I, well, yeah, uh, you can. And I was aware of Robin Clark's work, uh, Robin from UCL, who had looked at, actually at the Lindisfarne Gospels themselves and, and a few other books. I was aware that this technology could be applied to studying manuscripts. We have a spectrometer. Yeah, why not? I know nothing about manuscripts. So, well, well, who else do we need? We need an art historian. So I was introduced to Professor Richard Gameson. And Richard is an expert on medieval manuscripts at Durham University. In fact, he was one of the co-hosts of the exhibition. Richard was pivotal in deciding which manuscripts were coming to Durham for this exhibition. And we hit it off. We got on very well. Before you're allowed to touch a medieval manuscript, though, you have to get on well with the head of the library, because the librarians, those of you who are familiar with the name of the rose and the character of the librarian in the name of the rose, it's true, they are like that. <laughs> you have to get on with them. They have to give you a manuscript that you're going to shine a laser beam onto. They have to trust you implicitly. And we're very lucky. The head of special collection at Durham University, Sheila Hingley, was very willing to engage in this project. This is an interesting project because you've got a scientist and a historian working together and getting on, cooperating. This is something else, isn't it? <laughs> then comes the scary one. We had to get on with the cathedral librarian, and she really is scary, uh, in that this person holds the key, and the key is a physical key the size of you know, a, a, a shoe, to the vault of Durham Cathedral. And if she gives permission, we have access to a whole range of manuscripts. Durham is unusual. Durham University and Durham Cathedral are very unusual in that we've got an excellent collection of manuscripts of well-known provenance. We know what's happened to those books and when they arrived in Durham. Along the way, we also picked up people from archaeology, from physics, from geology, and maths as well. 
we built a team, and this team, this nucleation had happened simply out of a quick chat over a cup of tea in the tea room. What a fantastic coincidence. I always point out at this point, this is very me-centric. When Richard gives this lecture, he's here, I'm still on the periphery. <laughs> but I'm giving it today. So, my first response was, yeah, we can do this. I say that about most things. Yeah, we, we can do it. We have the technology, we can do it. The exhibition was coming to Durham in 2013. I don't know if any of you attended the exhibition. It was a marvellous exhibition. If you didn't, you missed a fantastic opportunity. Because we had present in the same building, in the same exhibition, manuscripts from the 6th through to the 12th, 13th century, all produced or all related to the northeast of England. And of course, the centrepiece were the Lindisfarne Gospels and the St Cuthbert Gospel, which are normally maintained here in London at the British Library. So this was a unique opportunity to see this family of manuscripts. They'd probably never been gathered together in this way for, for five, six hundred years, and probably never will again in our lifetime. It was a really fantastic exhibition. The question was, could we look at these manuscripts and analyse the pigments that are used to illuminate? Now, this isn't uh, a real illumination. This is the, the logo for the exhibition. Could we analyse the colours and the materials used to colour these manuscripts? Could we use spectroscopy to probe what, what they're made of? If we can, can we then see changes in pigment use with time, with period, with societal change? So we're spanning here from the 6th, 7th century, when you've got monastic book production, the likes of Lindisfarne and Wearmouth Jarrow monasteries, through to secular book production in the 12th, 13th, 14th century. You've got events like the Vikings coming along, the invasion. You've got the French, the Normans invading, bringing about, again, a change in society. You've got the plague in the 13th, 14th century. So we have these enormous changes in society and book technology. Can we map those using pigments? So when I was first asked, can you do this experiment? Can you tell us what a book's made of? Yeah, no problem. Bring along a manuscript. I've got a Raman spectrometer. Bring it along. We'll have a look at it. That's easy. <laughs> no, 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 you don't understand. Of course, I didn't understand. The books are priceless. These books are now, well, they're out of print. They're one-offs. They're incredibly valuable. They're, they, they are valued when books come on the market. For example, the St. Cuthbert Gospel, when it was bought by the British Library um, a few years ago, went for many millions of pounds. These books are worth their weight in, well, not even gold. It's a single isotope of gold. They're very, very precious. We're going to have to move our spectrometer to the books. They're not going to let them come to the chemistry department, because chemistry departments burn down. Everybody knows that. But it, we're, we're perceived to be a dangerous place. We can have a story about over that, a cup of tea, actually. But, yeah. So the books are priceless. We can't move them to chemistry. We're also not allowed to take samples, or we're not allowed to touch them. Whatever we do has to be non-contact, non-invasive. It leaves no footprint. The next generation of scientists are going to come along with better technology better instrumentation. When they look at these manuscripts, I don't want them to see my fingerprints or my burn marks or anything else there. We have got to leave the books in exactly the same condition as when we found them, when we came across them. So with no sampling, no touching, no burning holes in them. The techniques we chose to use were Raman spectroscopy, diffuse reflectance spectroscopy, and also imaging, uh, hyperspectral imaging. We're the first scientists to look at these books. The, the Durham collection has been in the cathedral cloisters in the strong room for hundreds of years. It's never been looked at, I suspect, by any scientists for any reason. It's certainly never been, uh, a scientific study has never been carried out on these manuscripts to work out what they're made of. And now the fun part, we're going to have to move a spectrometer to Palace Green Library. Now, any of you know Durham, the Palace Green Library is based on the grassy area between the castle and the cathedral. It's a 17th century building. It's completely unsuitable for running lasers, spectrometers, and the likes. But, yeah, we can do it. We can do anything. I've mentioned three techniques. Let's just put ourselves on the same wavelength, or wave number in the case of Raman spectroscopy. Let's just have a quick summary of the techniques we're going to use. Raman spectroscopy. We know that molecules are like children. They're always fidgeting around. They're vibrating. They vibrate with a characteristic frequency, or wave number, characteristic of the type of bonds and the atoms that the molecules are made of, the substance is made of. We can record those vibrational motions by Raman spectroscopy, in which we shine a laser beam onto the object, onto the material, and most of the light scatters 
with the same wavelength as the incident beam. In fact, 99.99999% of the light scatters with the same wavelength. But a tiny, tiny proportion, about one part in a million or a few parts per million of the light, exchanges energy as it bounces off the molecules. And by looking at the difference between what comes out and what goes in, we can work out what's been absorbed by the molecules on the page. That allows us to characterize the material. And the great thing is, the light isn't absorbed by the sample, it's bouncing off, it's scattering. Well, that's what it should be. The second technique I mentioned is diffuse reflectance spectroscopy. Now, you're all doing diffuse reflectance spectroscopy at the moment. You look around, you see colours. The reason you see coloured objects is that white light is bouncing off an object. So if we look at the red books or the green books or what have you, the white light, which contains all the colours of the rainbow, bounces off the object. Some is absorbed, some is reflected. In this case, the green object would reflect the blue, yellow and green light here. Uh, it absorbed the red. And therefore, by analysing the difference between what went in and what came out, we can work out the reflectance spectrum of the object, and that gives us information about the substance, the material that the object is made of, that's characteristic. The final technique is hyperspectral imaging, or multispectral imaging, where we simply take photographs through a single bandpass filter. We're only looking at particular single colours. So, for example, this is our standard colour card here, and you see it's got different coloured spots on it. If we look at this with a blue filter, well, lo and behold, the blue spots are actually paler, and the, the red are very dark because they're absorbing blue light, the blue spots are paler. If we look in the red, you'll see here the red is light because it's reflecting red light, and so on. In the infrared, virtually all of them are reflecting, and we can work beyond the limits of the visible spectrum. Our camera is sensitive from about 350 nanometers up to about 1100 nanometers. So that's significantly bigger range than, than your eye can detect. What we can do then is with these images, we can play games. And you'll see some examples of this later on when we come look at books. We can take this image and that image and do some number crunch. We can subtract this image from that one. Or we can do some really complicated maths called principal components analysis and look for trends, look for patterns in the intensities. And that allows us to analyze the, the pigments on the page in some detail. But let's go back to Durham, the start of the 2013 Lindisfarne Gospels exhibition. We're going to have to move our spectrometer, which is a big research-grade spectrometer, to Palace Green Library. The spectrometer is huge. It sits on a steel table about the size of the, the, the desk at the front here. It stands about so high, and it would fill this table. And underneath, the laser saw power supplies, the, the other bits and bobs, the computer and so forth. This kit weighs about a third of a ton. You can see here it took five people to move it. These three guys, the strong men of the department, are moving in the optical table. That keeps it rigid and, and stable. This is the spectrometer itself. I'm just watching for the step there. Um, these are two engineers kindly loaned by Hariba because this spectrometer is a bit like a Formula One racing car. Its performance is fantastic. It really is as good as it gets. The only problem is it needs fettling. It needs love and attention all the time. And so it needs to be tweaked and tuned. If you move it from one place to another, you've basically got to rebuild it. You've got to re-engineer it. And here they are, setting it up for me, free of charge, I hasten to add. Um, and very kindly, that they, they helped us no end with that. They were very generous. When we've got the spectrometer in place, well, let's have a look at a few features of the kit. This is a microscope. That allows us to focus the laser beam onto a tiny spot, uh, which is the, the area we're analyzing. The focus of the laser is fixed in space. We have to move our book around underneath it. And we have here a table. This clear piece of plastic moves around in the plane so we can move our book <coughs> underneath the, uh, the laser beam to get the right spot. And then we simply focus the, the, the microscope by moving it up and down. This is a research-grade spectrometer. It's got fantastic performance. It's got multiple wavelengths. And it, it doesn't make coffee, but it, it, you know, it does everything else. It's really quite a, a, a smart machine. But it is big. It's cumbersome. The first thing when you mention Raman spectroscopy to a librarian, you say, well, how does it work? Well, we're going to shine a laser beam onto your book, and we look at the light that comes back. And as soon as they hear laser, they think Darth Vader, Star Wars. <laughs> You're going to cut a hole through their book. And it, it really does take a lot of convincing um, to let people know that we actually, well, we do understand what we're doing, of course. And we've been extremely careful, extremely conservative with a small c about the power densities, and it's the power density of the laser that's important that we're operating. So for example, for our experiments, we're using less than half a milliwatt focused onto a, about a five micron squared um, area of the, of the manuscript. That compares 
well, we won't name authors here, but these, these are some contemporary papers. They're using about 10 times or more power than we do. So we're operating way lower in power density than anyone else who's worked in this field before. And we're quite confident there is no damage being caused. So we have evidence, and again, I'm happy to take or friend questions on that to say, what evidence do we have we're not causing damage? But we are causing no damage to the page. Whenever we start our experiment, the first thing we do is we measure the power underneath that microscope. That's the first thing you do before you put a book under it, before you, uh, before you start work. And bear in mind the half a milliwatt, well this laser pointer, I shouldn't say this if there's health and safety people here, this is about one and a half milliwatts, this green laser pointer, so we're less than the, 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 the laser pointer uh, power. This is actually a nice book, this is one of the Durham Gospels, uh, A217 being studied, here you see the, the microscope head, it's quite close, the microscope works about eight millimetres away from the page. It's quite stressful this, when you're doing this experiment, you're bending over looking at the book, making sure that the microscope head is nowhere near the page because obviously if you move the book with the head touching the page it could cause damage and so uh, we work for a couple of hours then have to pass it on to someone else to do it really is quite a quite an interesting exercise but we're very careful we, we cause no damage here's uh, another view of that book being studied after our first campaign of work at palace green library we realized that this was a bit of a pain. It's a great spectrometer, but it's rather heavy, and there's no way it's going to fit in the back of my car. I want Raman on the road. What I need, and Team Pigment is our operating sort of, um, sort of uh, logo now, what we need is a spectrometer I can carry around with me on a plane, train, or automobile, one that we can pack up in a suitcase and move. And there are some technical requirements, and these are quite stringent technical requirements. Um, when we talk to the instrument manufacturers, their eyebrows raise, not least, we want to go to very low wave number. We want to go to low, very low wave number because that's where some of the inorganic pigments show bands. It's really crucial to us. This is a deal breaker. And we, we sort of specified with the manufacturers and they said, no, we, we don't make spectrometers that do that, so we had to make our own. However, we now have a Raman spectrometer that fits in a suitcase. And here it is. Uh, this is at the Bodleian Library in, in Oxford. And this suitcase here, uh, which is the size of a, I mean, I've seen people on the train today with larger suitcases and that going on holiday for the weekend. It weighs about 20 kilos, it goes up and down steps, it goes on the train quite nicely, it gets lumped around the back of the car, uh, along with the hyperspectral imaging kit, which is here. This is my suitcase with my clothes for the week. Um, and it, you can see it's very straightforward to, to lump it around, to move it around. The other thing, when we moved the, the big Raman spectrometer to Palace Green Library, we had to set it up, and it takes about a day for it to stabilise, for everything to reach the same temperature, and then you have to tweak it to get it aligned. This is a really complex instrument. And what I'd like to show you now is the setup of our spectrometer. So just as a bit of fun, when we were in Aberdeen University, we made a video. And this is myself and my colleague Kate Nicholson um, setting up the spectrometer. It speeded up slightly. It took about 20 minutes in total. And at the end of this, the spectrometer is working and calibrated and aligned. It looks like great teamwork, but actually we're swearing to each other the whole way. Uh, this is the gantry. This is the Raman head, which is going to shine the, the laser onto the page. It's connected by these orange fibre optics here to the laser source and the spectrometer. This is the power meter. Remember, you don't do anything before you've measured the power. And of course, we've got a computer here. There's a camera stuck on top as well to do the hyperspectral imaging. And literally in half an hour, you, we're doing measurements uh, of getting out or getting into the, the room here. So it, it's a very easy um, kit. This is just a, another picture of it in use, looking at manuscripts. In fact, this is one in Keeble College. Um, here's the manuscript open. We, we prop the manuscript open on a cushion underneath the spectrometer. We move this head over the area we're interested in, turn on the laser, you can just see a dull glow here, and we record the spectra on the computer. There's a small microscope on this system as well that allows us to take images, micrographs of the area we're studying. We use these for archiving purposes so we know exactly where we've taken our Raman spectrum from. Because as we scan over the page, obviously the, the, there's a wide range of pigment use. Let's have a look at some books. This is a, a particularly beautiful book. This is uh, one of the Durham Cathedral books um, known as A210. This is um, the oldest, oldest illuminated British manuscript I made in the, in the British Isles uh, in, in the UK. Uh, it's got this fantastic uh, illumination, this, this highlighted letter here. 
Uh, this hole, I always point out this hole to everyone, this isn't us, we didn't burn a hole in the page. It's actually a hole in the animal skin. As the, the uh, vellum was stretched, as the animal skin was stretched, the hole got bigger. It's probably an insect bite or a small wound on the animal. But bear in mind, this page, which is about A4 in size, was a significant slice of cow at one point. And so you can't afford to throw it away and not use it just because it's got a hole in it, you still use it. And quite often you'll find these, these tick bites or, or holes that are formed in the, in the manuscripts and the parchment. Sometimes they're sewn up, sometimes they're, they're just left and, and written around, literally written around. But the illumination here, the coloured illumination, is, is the, the interesting part. It's hard to date manuscripts exactly. What, what you find is that the paleographers, the people who study the, the, the type of handwriting and the text of the, the, the books, they will have an estimate for a period when books were written. This is estimated to have been written in 635, plus or minus. So that, that's the estimate for when this book was produced. Probably, um, either if not in the northeast of England, uh, by monks who come from Ireland and Iona, then in Iona itself, or somewhere in the Hiberno-Irish uh, uh, import, if you like. So these books were produced by monks um, somewhere in the north of England or south of Scotland, southwest of Scotland. It's a beautiful manuscript. This is just a, a nice photograph showing how we're working. This is the, 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 in fact, this is the working objective here. This is a 10 times, this is the 50, we're doing a measurement. You can just about see a white spot there on the page. That's the spot where we're recording our Raman spectrum. And it looks like it's in the green here of the, of the, of the, uh, the serpent. And you can see this writing is absolutely exquisite. Quite a primitive manuscript. The, the, the um, ink, the, the pigment, is quite blocky. Uh, in fact, what you've got are, are large blocks of, of pigment with small dots, counter uh, dots on there, that contrast with the, uh, with the original, the underlying pigment. I didn't mention th this actually is, there's only seven pages of this manuscript. The rest of what must have been a huge Bible has been lost in time. So this is only a fragment of, of a gospel book. So, what we'd like to do is analyse the pigments on the page here. What can we find as we record the Raman spectra? Remember, Raman spectroscopy, we shine our laser beam on the page. In fact, it's normally a red laser. And we look at the scattered light. And what we plot is the difference between what went in and what came out um, in, in, on a wave number scale. Let's have a start off with this yellow up here. Yellow appears everywhere in the insular gospels, these early manuscripts from the 7th and 8th century. Bright yellow, it has this characteristic spectrum of orpiment, which is arsenic 3 sulfide. And we'll talk about this in a little while later on. I do have some examples if people want to look at this. This is a lump of arsenic sulfide. Again, you're welcome to come and look at this at the end of the lecture. Um, what you should do, though, is wash your hands, because obviously it's arsenic sulfide. This is poisonous. Um, so the monks who were handling this must have known that and must have discovered it. But it does give um, a beautiful canary yellow that has stood the test of time. And I suppose it's logical why that's happened, because no bug in its right mind would sit there eating the parchment soaked in arsenic. <laughs> it gets its name from the aura pigmentum, the pigment that's golden in colour. And it has this beautiful, beautiful bright yellow colour. Even today, if you look at any, any medieval manuscript, you have this bright yellow and it's, it's still pristine and intact. The orange colour we have here is red lead. And this is a nice spectrum, actually, of red lead, even though I say so myself. You get these characteristic bands and bumps. And we'll see some more red lead spectra. So what you need to do is just have a look at this spectra and start to imprint them on your retina. Red lead has basically two major peaks, one at low wave number and one at uh, about five, 550 or so reciprocal centimetre, two main peaks. Interestingly, and it's interesting because this particular manuscript has quite a bit of blue and green in it, the blue here has the spectrum that's characteristic of indigo, or woad. The indigo molecule is extracted from the woad plant. And again, we'll look at the chemistry of that in a, in a short while. Um, it's quite a straightforward process, and it's used extensively in, in this illumination in this particular book. We find it in many manuscripts, actually, later on. It's also in the, in the Lindisfarne Gospels. It has a characteristic spectrum. What's fun, though, is look at the green here. It's a bit of a muddy green. It's not a bright green, but it's a green nonetheless. How do you make green paint when you're at school? You mix yellow, you mix blue. And that's exactly what they've done. The Roman spectrum of our green here shows bands due to the indigo, and it shows bands due to the orpiment. They've mixed orpiment and indigo to produce a pigment known as Virgo. Virgo is a, is a made up green made by mixing some blue pigment with some yellow pigment. The most common form is indigo orpiment, but 
as again I'm happy to discuss later on, we found some crazy combinations of yellow and, and blue to make some very unusual greens, which I think are probably uh, almost unique in, in, in terms of uh, manuscripts. We then come on to the Durham Gospels, book A217. This is the, the pre-Dewey sort of notation. It, it's on the shelf as A217 in the Cathedral Library. A217 is a very significant book. It's thought to be the book from which the Lindisfarne Gospels were created. So this is the exemplar that was used to copy the text to create the Lindisfarne Gospels. It's basically a gospel book. Um, it's a beautiful manuscript in excellent condition. And again, we're seeing bright yellow. Now, we know this spectrum here. This is orpiment. Uh, we've got the red dots, characteristic red dots around the letters. This is very similar to the, those you find in, the, in many of the Insular Gospels, including the Lindisfarne Gospels. They're red lead on the page. Uh, and again, two bands, remember those two bands. There are some other pigments on the page here. There's this purple. Now, purple appears um, sometimes in these manuscripts, and we cannot get a Raman spectrum from it. Now, you may say, well, just turn up the laser a bit. But there comes a point where you have to say, no, we simply can't get a Raman spectrum from this purple. It's fluorescent, it's an organic material, it's not Tyrian purple, we know that because we've got Tyrian purple, we know that gives a good Raman spectrum. But it's an organic dye, probably Orsil, or, sorry, Orkil or Orsian, which is something similar to the, 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 the uh, litmus that you get from lichens. Um, but we can't identify it unequivocally. There are some people who claim that you can identify it by its fluorescence lifetime on the page, but yeah, uh, I, I think you can get any fluorescence lifetime, I suspect, from a manuscript. Um, the other one we couldn't get a Raman spectrum from was this green here, which is a very bright emerald green. It's got a few weak bands up at high wave number, but it's very difficult to get a nice spectrum from that. And again, there comes a point where you say, no, I can't get a Raman spectrum from it. You have to stand back and say, the next generation can do that. Or rather, we'll use a different technique. Let's use diffuse reflectance spectroscopy. So what we've done here is look at the reflectivity, and these are offset for clarity, as a function of wavelength. And I've just plotted the visible spectrum on here just so that you all know where we're at. The red dots, the red lead, shows this reflectance spectrum, quite characteristic of red lead. This is the orpiment. This is that of indigo and virgo. You see the, the indigo, if you take indigo and orpiment, then you get the virgo spectrum. This green band here has a reflectance spectrum well, it's absorbing blue light, it's absorbing red light, and then it carries on absorbing red light into the infrared. Characteristic of a D-to-D -D transition in copper. So the green here is almost certainly copper-based verdigris. And verdigris is a term we use very loosely in the, in the pigment world. It's some copper-based pigment that has been made from copper metal by, by pickling it in, in urine or in vinegar to give copper salts. Different to malachite, which is a, a green powder from the, the rock. Um, but this is characteristic spectrum of, of verdigris. Now we know it absorbs in the infrared, we can, do, we can play a game. We can start to do some infrared imaging. And these are three photographs taken. This is our very early work. Three photographs taken, one with a green filter, one with a red filter, and one with an infrared filter. And you'll see that in the infrared at 850 nanometers, the copper is dark. The green ring here is dark. That's because it's absorbing. And so very quickly then, with a, a very simple camera system, we can see copper on the page a mile off. So if you give me a, a page of a manuscript, we can see copper on the page in seconds, or even 60th of a second it takes for a, a photograph. Another book we looked at, this is where we need to remember that spectrum of red lead. This is a lovely book, A216, another of the Durham Gospel books um, from around the, 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 uh, the mid-700s. Um, here we've got, well, I always refer to it as the dragon's head, but it's a, probably a hound's head illumination. And we've recorded off this hound's head, which is about the size of my little finger, probably about 50 Raman spectra from different points. Remember, the Raman experiment is analysing a very, very small um, circle of 5 micron uh, square area. So we're sampling about 50 times on that, um, on that small area, and we get the same spectrum, we get that of red lead. And this is our red lead spectrum, two bands with a couple of small ones in the middle. Contrast that with this scribal mark, which appears at the top of the page, this little tick. We start recording spectra of the scribal mark, and sometimes you get a spectrum of red lead, PB304, and sometimes you get this spectrum, which is that of Massico, which is another lead oxide, PBO. So it's a different lead oxide. It's a mixture, actually. What we need to do, in, and again, in a couple of slides' time, we'll see why this is the case. What this is telling us is that the batch of ink used for this illumination 
was different to the batch of ink used for this illumination. In fact, what it tells us is the guy who made this pigment was a little bit sloppy when he was doing his chemistry. But we'll come on to why that's the case. A couple of other books. While the books were in Durham, we asked Corpus Christi College of Cambridge, who had loaned a book to the university for the exhibition, could we have a look at your book, please? And again, after some toing and froing, they agreed. They sent up a conservator to keep an eye on us to make sure we weren't doing anything we shouldn't with the books. And the book I'm describing here, Corpus Christi 197b, again is one of these insular manuscripts. Now, there's a sad tale to tell with this manuscript. This was a gospel book with the four gospels. And it was split up at some point with three gospel books based here in London and one in Cambridge. And the three gospel chapters in London were lost in the cotton fire, in the cotton library fire. So only this one section remains. We only have the one gospel, the gospel of John. We know it's John because as we look at the, uh, the image here, we see the eagle, which is associated with John. And this is the, the frontispiece of the book, this fantastic, magnificent um, sea eagle. It's fashioned on a sea eagle. And these colours look very familiar, don't they? We've got bright green, we've got red, we've got yellow. Uh, the black, I should have said, uh, is, is normally oak gall. And you can see it's transparent in the infrared. We did a, a number of experiments on this using Raman spectroscopy. Um, here we are looking at it. In fact, when, when we came to look at this, the conservator, we, we were poring over the books. Remember I said, we get very close to the books. We, we peer at them from a very shallow angle. And I noticed that the head of the eagle here has got little pimples on it yellow pimples, which turn out to be orpiment. And I pointed this out to the conservatory. He said, you know, I've been working with this book for teams of years. I've never spotted that. And normally, when they're looking at the books, people reading the manuscripts look at them from a distance, from 90 degrees, perpendicular to the surface of the book. We look at them very differently. And I think that epitomizes you know, the scientific approach, if you like. We look at things in a different way. We also observe that most of the books smell differently, too. They all pong a little bit differently. So here we are looking at the, the head of the eagle, and we really started then playing at hyperspectral imaging. This is my Andy Warhol version of the Gospel of John, because uh, we took two images, one at uh, 850 nanometers, and remember 850 nanometers, infrared, copper absorbed. So the copper green here is black in the spectrum. Contrast that with the spectrum taken in the green, well, although the green is dark here, the red really is dark. We take this image divided by that image, and we get this false color image here. Anything that's yellow on the page, is copper-based pigment. We can instantly map where our copper is on the page. This is a 600 divided by 550 nanometer image, and anything that is yellow here, I have to look at this and think about it, anything that's yellow here is red lead, and the, um, the reds tend to be orpiment. We can play the, play the same game. So we've got a way of extracting data from these manuscripts very quickly and comparing it to, um, or comparing the Raman spectra with, with what we see from the, the optical spectroscopy. Why have we done this? Well, the bottom line is we are building a pigment map, a map of use. And this is, I, mean, I don't expect you to read this, this is a map that we're creating saying, where is orpiment used? Which manuscripts? We're going to the literature, we're going to our own data. These are all into the Gospels, Gospel books produced 7th, 8th, maybe into the 9th century. We can look at where verdigris is found, where Virgo is found, indigo, and so forth. And we're then trying to work out, or my colleague in history, I say we, the royal we, it's Richard who's doing it. Um, we're trying to work out how these patterns are, are, are present and, and how technology of pigment use has been transferred. What we need to consider as chemists, though, is where these pigments come from. These are the pigments we've talked about so far. Red lead, or minium as it's called. Now, red lead, PB304, does occur naturally, but not in this country and not to any quality. However, Weirdale is built from lead sulfide. One of the, the, the minerals mined there by the Romans was lead sulfide. So if you take lead sulfide, you can smelt that to generate lead metal. Of course, that's well known. It's a, it's a straightforward process. You take your lead metal and you leave it with, uh, I think it's vinegar, and, and leave it in a pile of manure for a while, you get white lead. You then take your white lead and roast it at just the right temperature, and you get red lead. If you overcook it, i.e. you heat it up too much, then you get lead oxide, PBO. The people making these pigments, and this would be the monks in the monastery who were making the pigments, they were chemists. They were doing chemistry under very adverse circumstances. I would challenge any of you here to take some galena and convert it into red lead in your garden using no scientific equipment. Yeah? And, you know, I'm sure here in the Howard Halls of the Royal Society of Chemistry we have one or two card-carrying chemists. It would be really difficult to do that in your garage or with, without using any scientific apparatus. So respect to them. They knew what they were doing. 
Let's look at orpiment, this beautiful yellow pigment that we find in many of the manuscripts. It's not found in Britain. There are traces of it in, in Cornwall, but Cornwall really was a foreign country and still is to people from the northeast of England. Um, but uh, it, 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 there's no quality of, of pigment there. And judging by the amounts and the quality of the, the all pigment we find in the manuscripts, clearly they had a trade route. What you do find, you know, this is an example of a fumarole on a volcanic um, outcrop, you do find orpiment in Italy, either in the south of Italy or, or in the north. And so almost certainly, orpiment was a traded commodity. Orpiment was being shipped in during the regular pilgrimages that the Durham, or, or not the Durham, rather, the, the northeastern, the Northumbrian monks were taking to Rome uh, as part of their, their ritual. So when, when they went to Rome, it wasn't just one or two people going on EasyJet. There were a lot of people, perhaps 100 people, going for a six-month visit to Rome. It was a six-month trip, round trip to, to Rome. So they could have traded and brought back pigments with them. And this would be one of the valuable pigments that would have been purchased and brought back with them. But of course, it is arsenic. It's toxic. Again, they must have been very competent chemists or experienced to know you don't lick your brush. You don't, um, don't you know, get it on you anywhere. And when you're grinding, you have to be outside. Verdigris um, you get from copper metal. Again, copper metal has been known. You can get it quite readily in the UK. This is an example, actually, in our local public house where um, the copper is going off to give these beautiful blue and green deposits and um, simply scrape that off uh, and grind it up and you, you've got your, your green pigment. And this is a woad plant, which I'm assured by people who grow it is a bit of a nuisance. It's a weed. But you simply take the leaves, which contain an indole, the indole oxidizes and couples to give you the, the, um, the, the indigo here, which is the, the structure here. This is the insoluble pigment. You can make it soluble by dissolving it again in stale urine. It reduces to the, the leucodiol, which is twisted and soluble, but on exposure to air, it goes back to the pigment. So it's a quite a wonderful pigment and, and quite widely used. So we need to jump on a little bit. Uh, the Normans are coming. What do the Normans do for us? Well, they bought, actually, they helped found Durham, uh, Durham City, and the Cathedral of Durham was built as a result of the Norman Conquest. And when they, when they were doing that, they brought with them a monk by the name of Simeon, and Simeon wrote the history of Durham. And this is the book which belongs to the University of Durham, outlining Simeon's thoughts on the settlement of Durham. Um, we were asked, in fact, this is the first book we looked at, the first page we looked at, where, now my Latin's not very good here, um, so I apologise, but Richard did assure me this is where uh, Simeon is, is uh, claiming that the William de Calais, the then Bishop of Durham, was a really nice fellow and he's going to build a big church somewhere in Durham, and that's the cathedral we have now. If we have a look at the image here, it's a beautiful image, uh, notice the difference in complexity. There's tonality in here, they're using different blues, the red's much deeper, it's more like a cherry red. There's blues here that are really deep and vivid. And when we come to look at the spectra of the, uh, the pigments here, well, we've got our friend Orpiment still being used, but now we have a new red. This is vermilion, mercury sulphide. They really had to choose their materials then. This is pre kosh The blue <laughs> is lapis lazuli, the semi-precious stone. So the stone that is being used here, the only place you found it was in Afghanistan. So this has been traded literally halfway across the world. But this is a characteristic spectrum of lapis. Well, again, we'll look at the, the chemistry of lapis in a second. There's a big change. When the Normans come, sea change in pigment use. So the next question was, well, let's have a look at some changes. Well, let's have a look at the books that were produced around the change. From about 800, the Vikings invade Britain. They routed the monasteries on the northeast coast. In fact, they ultimately led to the settlement of, of Durham because the, the monks went on their, their, their um, exodus and, and settled in the city of Durham in 995. We know that there's lapis lazuli and vermilion in Durham in 1104 when Simeon wrote his book. Could we have a look at books produced between 800 and 1100 to see when lapis was being introduced? And where better to start than Canterbury? The two monasteries at Canterbury, the St Augustine and Christchurch uh, abbeys in, in, um, in Canterbury, they're close to the continents. They may well be trading pigments with the continental artists. Uh, can we see a change over time? So we went on a campaign, in fact, this is really fresh off the press. This is last week's work. We went on a campaign to Cambridge University to uh, Corpus Christi Library and to, um, uh, to Trinity College Library. And my colleague Richard, his expertise lies in paleography and the history of the book. I can ask him, 
to find a book or to tell me where there's a book from a certain time and a certain place. So we've got books produced in various locations, various uh, of the, the places, and we've got pretty good dating based on the paleography of the manuscripts. And then we analyse them to see whether there was lapis present and vermilion present. This is starting to show, actually, rather surprisingly, um, that the, the, the first look at this says, well, lapis is there from 950 onwards. Uh, this isn't the earliest um, find of lapis in a, in a UK manuscript. Uh, I, there are cases uh, about 30 years earlier, but whether they were additions, later additions to the book or not, in this case, we know this is part of the book. It's absolutely rife throughout the original uh, illuminations in this manuscript. But there's no vermilion in that book. So lapis and vermilion have arrived at different times. This is interesting because it tells us something about the, 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 the two routes, the two trades in those pigments. Well, quickly, this is a, a lovely page from one of the corpus manuscripts. Um, here we've identified, well, red lead, just remember the spectrum, two peaks, bit of fluorescence under there as well. Uh, lapis, we've got our lapis lazuli spectrum in the blue panels around the bottom here and in the blue panels on this illumination. We've got orpiment, the yellow pigment around here, and we're also finding indigo. Um, so they've used quite a, a collection of pigments in here. What was really interesting was that along with the Raman spectrum of lapis from these blue panels, there was a whacking great fluorescence. Now, fluorescence is the bane of the Raman spectroscopist. Fluorescence is normally thousands, if not tens of thousands of times more intense than the Raman signal. And sure enough, we were seeing a signal that was making the detector squeak. So we changed detectors. We had uh, a full laboratory in the back of the car this day. And we recorded the luminescence spectrum of the... Um, of, of the, the pigment, this blue pigment here. And lo and behold, when we excite the sample at 633 nanometers with our laser, we see a massive, strong fluorescence here in the near infrared around 900 nanometers. This band here, this dip, is because of the lens we were using, a particular microscope lens. We have a, a coating on it. This is indicative of Egyptian blue, which gave us a bit of a problem because we've never found Egyptian blue in a manuscript before. In fact, no one's reported Egyptian blue in a British manuscript before. And so this is a little bit of a surprise. In order to confirm it really was there and it wasn't just one speck of something strange, we then did a, a luminescence image. So we had to adapt the system. And this, again, is where um, being able to build your own kit is quite useful because we have a set of parts. It's a bit like Meccano or Lego. And we have to build our own luminescence imaging system. So what we did was took the infrared camera from the hyperspectral imaging, we switched off all the lights, and we illuminated with our laser this area here with diffuse red light, and we look and see, lo and behold, this starts to glow. And that is characteristic of Egyptian blue. In fact, the, the conservators at the British Library observed this about 10 years ago on Egyptian artefacts, that if you shine red light on them, they glow in the, in the near infrared. And Egyptian blue is now is being investigated for a whole variety of applications because of this rather unusual luminescence. But it's absolutely clear, these panels, these corner panels and the centre panels, and we've done it on all, of, all four and the centre, they contain lapis lazuli and Egyptian blue mixed together as an intimate mixture. They've been ground together. Turns out that another book from this monastery where this book was produced also contains the same mixture about 50 years later. And then books later on, there's no Egyptian blue. So at some point in history, they had a lump of Egyptian blue go to that monastery. It looks blue. They've ground it up with a lapis to dilute it, to dilute the expensive pigment uh, to, to give them their paint. In fact, there is a historical reference to a sculpture that existed in this particular monastery, St. Augustine in, in Canterbury. Um, in the 7th, 9th century, they had some Egyptian blue artifact there. So it looks like they've recycled it and reused that pigment. Quite an exciting find, though. So just again, these are the, the, the next set of, uh, of pigments. We've got lapis lazuli, uh, the beautiful blue semi-precious stone, which even today uh, is very valuable, comes from Afghanistan. Uh, it's reflective in the near IR, though, because it doesn't absorb in the near IR. We've got this pigment Egyptian blue, and I've just drawn or shown a picture of this blue hippopotamus. This is a synthetic pigment made in e Egypt pre-Christ. So it's a very, very old pigment, well known but not used in Europe uh, to any extent, not used in manuscripts really at all. There's only a couple of examples of European manuscripts where that's been found. Vermilion or cinnabar. Vermilion is mercury-2 sulphide, and you can either have synthetic or naturally occurring um, material. Almost certainly the material appearing in our early books would be ground-up cinnabar, probably from northern Spain. 
The final pigment which appears on the block is azurite, this copper-based material. And azurite, uh, one of my colleagues who works for the European Space Agency and is, is an expert on blue, don't ask why they need to know about blue, um, he said this is the most beautiful blue uh, ever. Azurite is the, 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 the perfect blue. It's cheaper, it's basically a weathered copper ore, um, and you do find it in manuscripts particularly from the 12th or 13th century onwards. We do have one early example of, of, uh, of azurite being used, but it is one that we come across quite frequently. So, that one week in Cambridge really um, got us scratching our head. We've got this early use of lapis, we've got this uh, Egyptian blue use, we've got a, a, an asynchrony with the, the use of vermilion. Uh, we're still seeing orpiment and, and indigo in use. It's really got us buzzing. We know an awful lot more now about the manuscripts that were being produced both in Britain just after the Norman invasion and in particular in this one centre. We've looked at what about 15 manuscripts now from, from that period. Sometimes you find pigments that aren't meant to be there. And um, this last year I've had a, I've been very fortunate and privileged to have a, a position down at Keeble College in Oxford. And given access to their library to study their manuscripts, of which they have a fantastic collection. And they have one particular one, Manuscript 42, which uh, is a very ornate uh, book of hours, French book of hours from the 15th century. It's a beautiful, beautiful manuscript. It was in private ownership for a long time, and we know that it was repaired, shall we say, or modified by a, a, a famous um, artist, Caleb Wing, in the 1960s. Could we see evidence of this repair? So here is the first two pages, the first um, photo. This is one verso and two recto for this um, manuscript. And you can see to the eye, oops, sorry, I've, I've gone too, too, haven't I? You can see to the eye here, the, um, the, the pages look very similar. They, 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 it's an incredibly uh, ornate text, but yeah, this looks pretty much the same as this one. The colours are similar, the pigment use looks very similar. But the camera never lies. Here we have the same page under red illumination and under infrared illumination. Look at these blue panels here. Two blue panels. In the red, they're both dark. In the infrared, we've got one light and one dark. They're different. They've used different pigments. In fact, what Caleb Wing has done, we've analysed this here. This is um, lapis lazuli. We know that lapis lazuli doesn't absorb in the infrared. Whereas in the original manuscript, throughout the rest of the manuscript, blues are azurite, this copper-based pigment. And so he's tried to mimic the original pigments, but has failed. He's used too old a pigment. Not just that, if we, we, we then go in a bit more detail, we get the Raman spectrometer out, we find there's red lead there. This is, so in the original page, there's red lead in the original manuscript. All the blues are azurite. You've got red lead vermilion. White lead's used, and lead tin yellow, the nice new yellow that's less toxic than arsenic. So that's being used. On the other hand, Caleb Wing, when he did his repair, well, he only uses vermilion in his red, no red lead at all. He's using chalk white, lapis lazuli, and lo and behold, dead giveaway, Prussian blue. Prussian blue didn't appear until 1704, and he's used it there. And then, so I was pointing this out to, to my colleague Richard and said, look, forensically we've got evidence this is a repair. And he said, yeah, it's obvious, because if you see the lady here warming herself by the fire, she's very modestly, in the 19th century, got her skirt just up to her knees. In the 15th century, she would have had her dress right up to warm as much as she could. And so this has been edited for the sake of decency. <laughs> I'll just flash you through, through a few more books. Just, this is really just to give you a flavour of manuscripts we have looked at and the wonderful depth and colour of illumination. This is a, a book of hours, a British book of hours, uh, again belonging to Keeble. Fantastic um, depth of illumination. This is, uh, the, uh, there's gold on here. There's orpiment being used, which is quite a late use of orpiment. Quite a, a simplistic text, really, uh, in terms of old-fashioned pigment use. Um, contrast that with this beautiful French book of ours. This is an incredibly detailed and, and busy image. Where do you begin with your Raman spectrometer on this? And we find this is a very rich manuscript. This is all the pigments that we found on this one page. And I'm sure we've missed some of the organic pigments out. They, it, they're incredibly detailed, incredibly... Um, complex and, and require, well, to get a, a good summary of the pigments here, you're looking at half a day or a day's work to achieve that. Tony's frantically waving at me, um, but I, I'd like to tell you about one last map or one last thing that we started looking at. This is a book that belongs to the Bodleian Library. Uh, it's basically a dictionary from about 1260, 1270. Um, it's produced in Spain. It's got Arabic influence, and, and it's a, 
a wonderful manuscript actually. When you look at it, this is actually how eclipses work. This is a, 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 a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse. So it explains the principle. And of course, the Earth is at the centre in both cases. Um, and then later on in the book, six pages later on, you've got this map of the world. But this map of the world contains details that just weren't known in the 13th century. It's completely out of time. You can see here you've got the, well, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, you've got Britain, a bit fragmented, Africa, uh, and the Red Sea, and so forth. This is more akin to a, a mid-15th century map. So the question we were asked is, could we analyse the pigments here, compare them to the pigments here in the rest of the book, and tell them whether or not this had been drawn in at a later date? So I'll skip through that. Here are the spectra, bits of the map. Uh, so we've got vermilion is the red. We've got lapis lazuli appearing lavishly throughout this book. It's just caked on the page. We've got orpiment still. It's 15th century is very late for orpiment, um, but it, it's quite extensively used. We then started playing with our hyperspectral imaging kit. We took five photographs, different wavelengths, so in the, the blue, the green, the red, or the yellow, <coughs> the red and the infrared, we take these photographs and we throw them into the computer and say, what do you think? And the computer does a process called principal components analysis. It looks for common trends between different pixel intensities. <coughs> and it throws the data into clusters. So it's come up with cluster, cluster 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then we say, right, show us all of this cluster here. Where are those pixels on the map? And from that, we can generate basically pigment maps. So this is one cluster of data, and it shows us where all the blue lapis lazuli is on the page. This is another one, it shows us where all the orpiment is on the page. And another one shows where all the copper-based pigment is on the page. So with three or five, rather, exposures, and a couple of minutes on the computer, we can generate a, a map of pigments on the page. And this is really quite a powerful technique. We've now modified this, because five isn't enough, to a nine um, wavelength experiments. We do nine different photographs, and, and we can do far more complex uh, separation of pigments on the page. So as a quick summary, uh, surprisingly, they are using period pigments for this, um, for this map, but they're using pigments that aren't used elsewhere in the book. Lapis was used, orpiment wasn't used, and copper wasn't used. So the map has been painted in to make it look original. It's not a palimpsest. This sheet had always been blank for additions to be made to it. Um, and in order to paint that map on, I was assured by my, my story and colleagues that you have to take the book apart to do that, which is no mean feat. Why would you take a book apart? It's a big exercise. But it turns out, we found recently, this was given as a gift to the son of a king. So it was a prestigious gift. It's been updated, and the map has been drawn in. And they've tried to use pigments that, again, would fit in with the period. I think at that point, I shall defer to Tony um, waving at me. Um, what I do need to say, if I may, if you bear with me, just a few final comments. Um, it's actually a, a huge privilege to be granted access to these manuscripts. And the librarians uh, are incredibly trusting. Um, you know, from, from all the university libraries we've attended, we've literally had manuscripts placed in our hands carefully, not thrust, but carefully placed in our hands, and said, well, go on, you know what you're doing then now. And that's an enormous privilege when you bear in mind the the rarity and the importance of these books um, and, and their value, both as cultural items and, and their financial value. It's been a great experience working as part of a, a, a wacky, multidisciplinary, and that's a word that vice-chancellors like to use, uh, team. We've got a huge snowball of people from all corners of the university now interested in team pigment work. So we call upon people to help us to, um, to, to support the work. And so from Durham, we've got departments of chemistry, history, geology, archaeology, physics, mathematics, I always forget, left them out. We've had support from companies in terms of logistical support, instrumentation. Uh, in fact, Procter & Gamble funded one of my students and didn't realise he was looking at manuscripts for a, a couple of months. And then we've looked at the various uh, manuscripts. Getting past the librarians, getting the trust of librarians is, is, is really important. And then finally, Team Pigment. Um, these are the guys, Kate Nicholson and Andy Duckworth, do a lot of the work on the books with me. Um, my academic colleagues. Uh, we had three consultants uh, assisted with the project, Bernard Meehan and Robin Clark, both experts on manuscripts, and Tony Parker, as you've heard, knows a bit or two about Raman spectroscopy. He's an expert on Raman spectroscopy. And then finally, this wouldn't have been possible without some money and 
technical help, and Rob and Felicity Shepherd, who I'm pleased to say are with us this evening, I'm very grateful for both um, their, their financial assistance and also their nucleation of this project. Because out of that casual conversation, what do you think came this fantastic all-consuming project? One final thing is, after we did our first run in the basement of the, the university library, um, I'd gone down with a horrible lurgy, as had Kate Nicholson, and Andy Duckworth, my PhD student, was fine. We couldn't work out what was going on until I, I read this in one of the, the books. If you treat manuscripts with disdain, if you don't wash your hands fast and wear a white owl before you handle, in fact, this was the Cuthbert Gospel, then something bad would happen to you. This was the superstition um, put forward by Reginald of Durham. And one day, my student Andy turned up, <laughs> unprompted, wearing his white owl. But he didn't get the lurgy, so maybe there's something in that after all. What was even more bizarre is the library staff just nodded and let him in. <laughs> On that note, thanks again for your attention and the invitation, and I'm happy to, to answer questions. Thank you. Some roving mics around. Uh, David, you can have them. That's just a, <clears throat> a question out of ignorance, really. I'd always thought that organic pigments really were not very light fast, and these are very old manuscripts. Uh, am I mistaken that indigo is actually very light fast, or is it just they've been kept in? in the dark or...? or, or. Well, it's a, it's a combination. If you compare, um, say, a painting to the manuscript, then obviously the manuscript has very little light exposure in comparison. But indigo is actually quite light fast. So when, when you pump it up to its excited state, it's got that extended hydrogen bond, so it's got a facile way of getting back to the ground state. It is slightly fluorescent. You, you, you'll see fluorescent spectrum indigo. In fact, one of the diagnostics we use for it. But it is phenomenally stable. Yeah. That there are examples um, within living memory. There are some manuscripts that um, Richard has anecdotally uh, mentioned that are left out in, in, in book cradles for people to observe, and they have degraded in, in living memory, so which, is, which is a tragedy, really. But so some pigments do degrade. Hello. First, I'd like to thank you for uh, a fascinating and very well delivered lecture, but uh, as well as pigments, you needed uh, binders to stick them onto the page. Yeah. Have you done anything to uh, differentiate between proteins used? Maybe, uh, you know, can you tell of albumin or...? Yeah, well, we, we can't at the moment, and to do that you really need to use infrared spectroscopy, using true infrared spectroscopy. And there are groups around the world doing that, um, and so that is something we'd like to move towards. So it's not a, an area of expertise we have at the moment, but it's something we're looking to develop. And you're absolutely right, the use of binders is, is crucial. So you'll typically find egg white as being used, or an animal gum, and or egg yolk appears quite often in, in the Italian manuscripts, for example, that we've looked at. And these have different, very different properties. So the egg yolk is a pain for us because it contains luminescent materials. It, it, it fluoresces quite strongly. But we do need to address that. It is something that, that we need to go for. The problem comes in actually, well, building a portable infrared system that will have the sensitivity to be able to differentiate between different materials. Um, pe people have, uh, in fact, I haven't got with me, but th there are people doing that in laboratory um, environments, but taking it on the road might be something else. But the next generation of instrumentation, if there's any representatives of instrument companies here, you know, we're, we're chasing them hard to try and um, to persuade them that they've got to build better spectrometers. Thank you. Bear with me, there's a lot of you with hands up. Uh, could you just go to the back, please? Um, I suppose a little less of a technical question, but out of England and Ireland and the influence in between the two, what, what book that you haven't seen yet that you would absolutely love to get your hands on and why? <laughs> ah. There is a, a manuscript in Corpus Christi that I was looking at last week, uh, and not quite salivating, uh, but th there's the St. Augustine Gospel at, uh, Cam at Corpus Christi, which is the, <coughs> one of the oldest manuscripts in Britain, and uh, it is incredibly significant because it's one of the first gospel books to have been brought to, to Britain from Italy, and so that would be a, a, an exquisite book to look at. But 
when, whenever we look at a manuscript, what you find is that although superficially they all look similar, you fall into them. It's like sort of falling into a, you know, a, a tunnel and you can get drawn into a picture. And the, the complexity of the, the artwork in these miniatures is, is phenomenal. So the, the French and Italian Book of Hours are exquisite in the, in the depth of, of colours and, and the, the, the imagery that they're using. So I, I've not yet found a boring manuscript. Thank you. And Blue. Thank you, very interesting. Are you in a position to look at the pigments and the mixtures of pigments and the binding agents used and essentially produce fingerprints of pigments used by different production centres and therefore differentiate where these books are produced? That, that's exactly what we're trying to do now. So uh, out of the original study, which was looking at the insular gospels, the insular books, we realised that actually there, there is a, a void of information about the pigments being used through the British Isles through the ages. <coughs> and so what we've got now is a set, we've studied about 75 manuscripts. So we have, and we study manuscripts not randomly chosen, but very specifically targeted because we know when they were produced and where they were produced, and, and often why they were produced, so what budget they were being produced on. So we will go for... Um, we will go for these manuscripts and look for them, and then we're building up a map of Britain through the ages, and that we're starting to see patterns emerging. The Canterbury story is a nice example. That's just one microcosm, if you like, of this bigger picture, and that's what we're, we're seeking to do in the future. But we need, some, uh, we need to get an AHRC grant to do that. That's the next challenge. Sorry. Um, thank, thank you oh, again. Oh, sorry. Um, I wonder, do you know whether anything comparable has been done at all with the Book of Kells? I ask in particular, not just for general interest, but because I heard a scientific program on the radio some years ago which said lapis lazuli had been thought, and I was taught long ago to have been used in the Book of Kells, but that scientists had found that it was not in fact lapis, and I think they said it was a scientist from London. I'm wondering, listening to you, what techniques they used if they didn't have access to what you have. Right, so yes, Kells has been studied. Um, the Book of Kells was studied by Susan Biotti and Bernard Meehan, uh, who's one of the consultants, um, a few years ago. Um, the, so it has been studied using Raman spectroscopy. In fact, what they, they, the, um, the, the group from Dublin um, literally moved a spectrometer, much as we had done, to the, to the library where Kells is kept in, in Trinity College. Um, the fact that they don't find lapis in there is not surprising. You don't find lapis until certainly the 10th century. Um, there was a great myth that lapis largely appeared in the Lindisfarne Gospels and, and also in the Book of Kells. And this was based on the appearance of the, the, the almost iridescent blue pigmentation on the page. In the 1950s, Rus and Runger, uh, a German scientist, had looked at these manuscripts using essentially a, a microscope and said, because it looks like lapis lazuli, it is lapis, and, there, and he wrote it in a textbook, and therefore it became law, it was lapis lazuli in these books. It was only in the early 2000s that Robin Clark from UCL used Raman spectroscopy to show that it's not lapis lazuli in these, these older books. Um, you, you see that it's actually indigo being used in, in those manuscripts, in both Kells and, and in the Lindisfarne Gospels. Um, but still people talk about lapis lazuli in the, in the Lindisfarne Gospels or, um, or, or the Book of Kells. But it's certainly not lapis. In fact, uh, I should be very careful. There are some people where well, you know, you're using indigo to make it look like lapis, but no, they, they, they didn't have access to lapis in those days, in the, the 8th century. It wasn't, uh, the 9th century, it wasn't around. And there was one more in the middle there. Jacob's over and the Pigment Project at the British Library. Ah. That Robin worked for us. <laughs> of course, I know your papers work. we would produce would be interesting to put with your papers, so we could build that database of our work together, perhaps sometime. Yes, actually, we we um, we have some very interesting. Uh, perhaps if we can have a chat at the end, if you have two seconds, because we have one really interesting observation that we could perhaps share with you uh, about a, a key manuscript, um, that the, one of the the cathedral collection. Um, which would fit in very nicely with some work. But I, I'm aware of the, the work that was done. In fact, I, I perhaps reverse the question. Um, a lot of, just for people's information, a lot of work was done by Robin Clark and, and a group in the British Library in the, I guess, the late 90s and early 1000s. Yeah. So uh, work was done on manuscripts um, during that time using Raman and other forms of spectroscopy. Um, I think the, the slight differences, if you like, is that we, we've, um, we've seen that there's this 
the, the putting together of the pattern hasn't been done. And so we're, we're calling extensively, in fact, on your work to, to fill in some of the gaps. You'd have seen in the, um, in the pigment table you know, that those are cherry-picked from, from the work of, of yourself and Robin and, and uh, Michelle and Catherine Brown. Um, are there any old documents which aren't church documents? Um, um. I guess the closest one would have been the 13th century Deuce 319, the, um, the, the, the encyclopedia. But quite where it was produced, I'm not sure. It was a, a Spanish book, uh, presumably produced with monastic input, um, but I, I'm not aware of, the, um, uh, of the, the author, or the nature of the authors of that book. But virtually all of the books are uh, theological in nature, the ones we, we look at. It's only really much later on that you start to find um, other manuscripts appearing in printed uh, form, and they tend not to be the illuminated manuscripts. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to draw it to a close there. Andy Beebe will quite happily uh, answer some questions for a while if you want to come up and talk to him personally. Andy, that's been a splendid talk. Thank you very much. Um, I mentioned cameras earlier on. You know, it's getting to the point with this technology that pretty soon you'll just be able to put your camera on the plane. It'll get off, it'll take the pictures, and it'll come home, <laughs> and it'll tell you what you did. But actually, for me, I'm just looking forward to being able to say, uh, I'm just going to go and take a Raman Spectre of that rock or that painting in that gallery. <laughs> a few year more years, maybe? Mm, yeah, it's not too big. <laughs> well, can I just add, if, if anyone would like to see, um, there's some examples at the front here. I'll, I'll leave these out. These are some examples of, um, of pigment use um, by, one, by Andy Duckworth, by my student, who's been... He's not counterfeiting documents, I hasten <laughs> to add. But he's just illustrating the depth of colour you can achieve with the original pigments. And there are some samples of the pigments here. The one caveat being, don't eat them. They're poisonous. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, press Andy Beebe. Thank you.